going to talk a little bit about syntax, which is the third element of correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. The other two elements are correct sentence structure, communication, that's one, parse, that's two, and syntax, that's three. And it's all part of the grammar, which is a technology that was brought to the public in 1988 by Colin David Eiffelwin Colin Miller. If you're not familiar with it, then uh, you might be lost in this video. I highly recommend checking out my other content on TikTok and more specifically go to my YouTube channel, which you can find a link in my bio, www.youtube.com forward slash Jason Matthew Glass. And you can find lots of beginner videos over there explaining what correct sentence structure is and what it can do. So today I'm going to focus on syntax, which for a lot of people is their favorite thing to talk about or think about doing. So basically what you think about, when you think about syntax, think about what it is, right? Syntax is basically how words work together to create meaning so that a sentence will make sense to you. Sentence. Makes sense, all right? Now, in what we would call the plain English language, there's word and language modification going on. The syntax is a fictitious conveyance of grammar because there's modifiers in there. Now, the premise behind this is that if you were on a witness stand giving testimony and the court wants to know the facts, just straight up, unfiltered facts. If you modify a fact, you've now changed that fact. You've changed the value of that fact. Change is modification. Modification is perjury. That's what's going on in what we would call the plain English language. There are modifiers. Straight up, if you just think about the terminology used by plain English grammar, you have adverbs, you have adjectives. Those are quite literally modifiers. They modify the value of something. With correct sentence structure, there is no modification. One and one is one. One word, one meaning, one congruency, one function, so on and so forth down the line. But in the fiction, what we call the fiction, the plain English language that we all use, the one that I'm using to speak right now, there is modification all over it. First, you have to think about what each word is and what it means to you in order to begin syntaxing. Now, if you're familiar with correct sentence structure, you will know that there are 10 parts of speech in this grammar technology. Zero is conjunction, one is adverb, two is verb, three is adjective, four is pronoun, five is positional, six is lodial, seven is fact, eight is past tense, nine is future tense. In the plain English language, if we are syntaxing fiction babble, we would use the values of zero, one, two, three, four, eight, and nine. Conjunction, adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, future tense, past tense. Those are what we would use. The reason there are numerical values placed next to those parts of speech is because when you look at a document, instead of writing out the word adverb, verb, adjective, and pronoun, you just put the number value there to represent that part of speech. It's for efficiency's sake. So that you can show the fictitious conveyance of grammar, you can syntax the document, syntax meaning putting numerical values next to or over top of the word showing the grammar modification. Adverbs modify verbs and adjectives. Adjectives modify other adjectives and pronouns. Now the first step to doing this is to 
use a terminology that I call tangible contract and non-tangible contract, or another way to say it would be fact-based or non-fact-based. Is the word you're looking at based on a fact or not based on a fact? Is the word you're looking at tangible contract or non-tangible contract? And what I mean by that, and I'll give the simplest example I can think of. Let's say the word, um, hmm, let me think. Of. Okay, here's one. Tomato. Is tomato tangible contract or non-tangible contract? Do you have a tangible contract with what a tomato is? Is the tomato based on a fact? Yes. I mean, that is the sensation that should have came into your head is that, yes, tomato would be considered tangible contract. Now think of the word the, T-H-E. Is that the same? Does that give you the same type of feeling that a tomato does? No, it doesn't. The is just three letters put together, and you don't even know what it is except for the fact that the fiction grammar tells you what it is. So the is a modifier, and it is non-tangible contract. Well, in some cases, it's a modifier. In some cases, it's not a modifier. But if you say the tomato, the is non-tangible contract. Tomato is tangible contract. So, in correct sentence structure, tangible contract words would either be verbs, adjectives, or pronouns, and non-tangible contract words would be adverbs, verbs, or pronouns. Tangible contract words will never be adverbs, and non-tangible contract words will never be adjectives. So, the tomato, adverb, dangling, participle, verb. And if you ask, what is a dangling participle verb? Well, think of what a verb is. A verb is thinking. We, we were taught in school that verb is action. It's movement. It's thinking. Well, in this case, because tomato is being modified by the word the, the tomato, adverb, verb, tomato is now a verb, and verb is thinking, and tomato comes at the end of the sentence, there's nothing left to think about. So the verb is just dangling there. Dangling participle verb. That is what a dangling participle verb is. So that's the difference between tangible contract and non-tangible contract. Now, the way that you can actually certify and credential it is that you would look it up in an etymology dictionary. Look up the word tomato. How many syllables does tomato have? I was taught in elementary school the way you find out about syllables is you say tomato. So there would be three elements to tomato within that context. So you would look up the word tomato in an etymology dictionary and you would find out the earliest nativity root meaning of the word. And if that's tangible contract, then you would syntax it as tangible contract. And then you would also look up all three syllables of the word separately and credential those as well. And the same thing with the, you would look up the in an etymology dictionary is that tangible contract or non-tangible contract? And if you look up the word the in an etymology dictionary, you will find that this is the hallmark of most non-tangible contract words is that it will try to give meaning to itself using itself or using other non-tangible contract words like this, that, these. Those are all non-tangible contracts. Now, in correct sentence structure, if I was to try and articulate what this is, the simplest way to do it, just like my name, colon Jason I from Matthew Collins Glass, or if you just use my first name, colon Jason, the colon stands for, the colon represents a position in, positional and lodial phrase. For the Jason, period. For the tomato, period. The positional is represented by the syntax value of five, the is a lodial, it's represented by the syntax value of six, and tomato is represented by the syntax value of seven, which is a fact. And the four is the, is the positional, for the tomato. Position lodial fact, five, six, seven. That is how you would position the tomato as a fact. Now, if you say the orange tomato, 
the orange tomato. Now you have the is non-tangible contract. Orange is tangible contract because it is a color and you can certify it. And orange, and uh, I'm sorry, I said tomato. Tomato is tangible contract. The orange tomato. So the is an adverb. Orange is an adjective and tomato is now a pronoun. You've modified this. You've modified the is a adverb modifying orange into an adjective, which is modifying tomato into a pronoun. So if I was to try and articulate this in correct sentence structure, I might say something like this. For this claim, it's knowledge of the facts is with this claim of the witness with the color hyphen orange of the tomato with this sensation by this claimant, period. And I positioned the tomato as a fact. I've positioned the color of the tomato as a fact. And there is no modification in that sentence. So I've just shown you how to credential tangibility and non-tangibility. I've just shown you the syntax values, how to syntax a sentence. And I've also showed you the solution to the problem of grammar modification and how to create a correct sentence structure. So now I'm going to pause on that and I'm going to take a look at the comments and see if anybody asked any questions. Is red a fact? Because it is. Red can be a fact if you position it correctly. But red can also be a modifier. Just not in correct sentence structure. Like, how would you be able to articulate in correct sentence structure the difference between a salt shaker and a pepper shaker? For the shaker of the salt, for the shaker of the pepper. Now, the whole premise behind this grammar it's an answer to the problem of what some people would call legalese. The language, the special language used by the Bar Association in foreign vessels and dry dock and admiralty courts and things like that. They have a special language unique to them that they have to send their vassalese to school to learn for seven plus years. And even then, they don't know the whole legalese. So the average, you know, Joe or Susie or whoever doesn't have access to this stuff. I mean, you, sure, you can study Black's Law Dictionary and so on and so forth, but there's no way you're going to have the same education level as someone who went to one of those schools for seven plus years and learned legalese. So it is not fair. The foreign vessel and dry dock, the legal system is, there is nothing fair and just about it. I mean, you just, you just have to take uh, one look at the, their symbol. Who, who, who they call Lady Justice with the blindfold and the scales and the sword. That, that's, I mean, if you look at that, that brings a smile to my face, a chuckle, because who would ever go anywhere near someone who's blindfolded with a sword? Why would justice be blind? Justice has to be rule one, rule equal. It has to be fair. You have to be able to see all the facts in front of you and consider everything. You can't be blindfolded. If you're blindfolded, then you don't know what the hell you're doing. 
that just shows it illustrates the arbitrariness of the of the court system. So correct sentence structure is a solution to that. In that anyone can learn it and master it and use it to create their own court system of which they are the authority. I know some people are going to shake their head at that and, and they're going to be like, well, that's how can you do that? That's nonsense. Well, that's why you don't know the grammar. If you take the time to study this stuff and learn the grammar, you'll see how the logic works. Because if you truly think that life is fair for everyone, if you truly think that, if you truly participate with that concept, then anything the fiction system does, you can do. And I can do as well. We can create our own courts. We can create our own contracts. We don't need a third party to give authorization to anything we do. Of course, the fiction system would like you to believe that you need that permission and authorization. It would like you to believe that there is an authority above you, which there isn't, unless you believe it. Authority comes from knowledge. Okay, authority comes from two places, or authority... How can I put this? Let's see, authority can be stressed in two different ways. For the autonomous individual, authority comes from knowledge. If you know what you're doing, you have authority. Authority, look at the word authority. The word author is in the word authority. In order to be a, an authority of a document, you would be the author of it. Author, authority, authorization. And the second way is to give consent to someone else to be your authority. Like a judge, when you submit to a summons or whatever, you have now submitted to their authority. You have put your life in their hands the minute you walk through their door, answer their summons, and go in to beg and plead. You have now thrown yourself at their feet by consent. You don't have to. You can be your own authority if you choose. So that, that's the best way I can put it. Like someone once told me that in legalese, in the legal system, the way you can find a loophole in the legal system is if you think of a word or a term and look it up in Black's Law Dictionary, and if Black's Law Dictionary does not contain that term, that's a loophole that can be used. And of course, in, in fiction court systems, it's all about loopholes, man. It's all about trying to take advantage of or use subterfuge or whatever it is, trickery. That's why I call it tricks and traps. Because it's not an honest, fair system. I think there's no accident that the word lawyer is very similar to the word liar. For example, think about, think about how you, as a human, interact with your environment. How do you interact with your environment? How do you navigate your everyday life? What do you use to safely navigate through the sea of space? Walking from your front door to your motor vehicle. Walking down the street, what are, you, what are you doing to navigate safely? You're using your eyes, your ears, your nose, all manner of senses. Literally, your port of sensation. 
That's what you're using to navigate. What happens is data from what you would perceive to be your external environment comes into your port of sensation, which you interact with through your five or more senses. That's firsthand knowledge. And that data docks at your port of sensation and then you cognize that data, formulate knowledge, and then transship it out as claims. In other words, you wouldn't exist if I was not sensing you, if I wasn't thinking of you right now, and vice versa. If I die, if I pass away, mm, how do they say it now? I don't, I don't wanna get in trouble here on TikTok. If, if I'm unalive, then the world, everything ceases to exist for me because I may only make a claim for myself. I would not exist if you were not sensing me. If you weren't watching me on TikTok, I wouldn't exist for you. You wouldn't even know about me. You see how that works? It's firsthand knowledge, your senses, your sensations. Now, the reason why I went into this big explanation is because you can look in any edition of Black's Law Dictionary, you will not find the word sensation or sense in and of itself being given a definition. You will not find it. And the reason why is because sense and sensation cannot be argued. I can't tell you what you're sensing. Only you can do that. The example I like to use, this is a hot cup of coffee. If I spill it on my arm and I say, ow, that hurts. You can't say, that doesn't hurt, Jason. That's not hot. Or you touch a hot stove and burn your hand. You say, ow, that burns. And then someone says, that doesn't burn. You see how ridiculous that sounds? You can't argue it. And foreign vessels and dry dock are all about arguing, arbitration, mitigation. Correct sentence structure eliminates all that stuff. So that's just one example. The word sense and sensation, those words are not in any Black's Law Dictionary that I know of. Because I feel, and this is my, my own humble perception, that they don't want to allow words like that in their, in their courts because they cannot be argued. No one can tell, no man can tell another man what they're feeling. How would they know that? That's an assumption presumption. Yes, I did talk about syntax earlier in the stream. I actually gave the rudiments of how to syntax, how one would start it off, why you would do it, and how it pertains to correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. So you can find this stream maybe in 24 hours or so. I will publish it on my YouTube channel in the TikTok live stream playlist. Does anybody have any questions about what I've already discussed here? I use the sea of space. I don't care if I'm on the land or, or on the water or if I'm underground or in the sky. It's all the sea of space for me. Do you have the most recent copy of the DWM book? I have a copy of the David Wynn Miller book that I actually purchased from David Wynn Miller himself and he sent it out to me. Now, myself, as a quantum grammar tutor, teaching since 2018, I do not recommend David Wynn Miller's book. I don't care what edition it is. I do not recommend it at all to beginners because there are mistakes on every single page. Literally, multiple, multiple errors. If you're looking to learn the grammar and you're a beginner, that book is not going to help you by my humble perception as a tutor. And I've done videos on that as well as where I've audited the book and shown all the mistakes. Um, when I first started learning this in 2017, I actually reached out to David Wynn Miller and uh, spoke with him and I said, I said, uh, you know, David, there are mistakes, there are spelling errors all over your website. 
do you mind if I, if I correct the errors for you? I didn't know the grammar at the time, but I could see spelling errors. I could see that much. And he wrote me back in all caps, said, send me the errors. So I began correcting his website and communicating with him and learning the grammar from him at the same time. And he began correcting his website. But then, as we know, you know, a year later, he passed away in the summer solstice of 2018. But there are mistakes all over his website. There are mistakes all over his book. I do not recommend that book for a beginner. Well, one place you could start is my YouTube channel. You can find a link in my bio. There are almost 900 videos there that I've personally created with me in them teaching correct sentence structure. I have a syntax playlist, a parse playlist, a correct sentence structure playlist. I have a mini class playlist. I have a psychology playlist. The sum total of my correct sentence structure knowledge is available for free on my YouTube channel in over 800 videos, almost 900 videos. There are beginner videos over there. There are advanced videos, all levels. Everything, a person could actually learn the grammar pretty much 75 to 85% of that technology on my YouTube channel without having a tutor. Eventually, at some point, though, however, you're going to need a tutor. And if you'd like to start sooner than later, you can contact me again at the link in my bio for my email address, jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com, and apply for a workshop. Just send me an email. Include your full correct name so that I know who you are. You know who I am. I just ask the same consideration of you. And say, you know, I'm interested in applying for your workshops. And then I would give you... I would schedule a 10 to 15 minute video consultation between you and I, and then you could ask me whatever you want and I'll ask you and we'll see if it's a good fit. If this something, this is something you're really willing to commit to because it is a commitment and uh, I'm only interested in teaching serious students. I teach. Every <coughs> Sorry about that. I have a dinosaur in the other room. I only have an interest in teaching people who are very serious and committed to this stuff. And there's not very many of them out there. But I teach from beginner, intermediate to advanced, wherever you are on the geometric level. <laughs> Playing field of uh, knowledge education. I will meet you there and take you where you're motivated to go. One moment, please. Uh -huh. Say hello. Uh -huh. Hello. Hello. So back to what I was saying about the workshops. It's just like walking into a classroom, only you're the only student. I tailor the workshop to you, your individual needs, your knowledge level, so on and so forth. So it's up to you. For more information, contact me, jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com. I'll answer whatever question you want in the confidential in that venue. Any other people you've audited that show less mistakes? I know Christopher has many mistakes too. Do you offer consultations? Yes. Yes, if you want to apply for a correct grammar workshop, I will schedule you a 10 to 15 minute consultation in the confidential. Uh, I will provide the venue. I, I'll tell you right now, I use Zoom. That's what I've been using for almost six years now. That's the only thing I use. So, um, yeah, you have to be able to use Zoom. It's pretty simple. I've very rarely, I've only had one or two people out of hundreds and hundreds of people over the last few years that have ever had a problem using Zoom. Um, Christopher. I think what that individual means is Mark lowercase k Kishon Christopher. Mark lowercase k Kishon Christopher does not know correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, or more accurately, I would say that he shows no evidence that he knows correct sentence structure. I've seen his website. I've seen his documents that are in the public. You can look at them the same as I can. His correct sentence structure is horrible. And his syntax, the guy does, does, doesn't not know how to syntax. 
But one thing he does know how to do is parse words. Like he can show you the words that mean no contract and things like that. I mean, he's pretty good at that. But that's it. He doesn't know correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. At least he shows no evidence of knowing it. <laughs> That's pretty funny, Eric. That's a good one. I predict that AI will never learn correct sentence structure. I predict it. At least not in my lifetime. I think AI will probably destroy the human race before it learns correct sentence structure. <laughs> I guess I'll touch on one other element in this live stream because um, we've already covered the syntax at the beginning. So at the tail end, I'll throw in some psychology. You and I, and this is a guess on my part, but you and I, everybody watching this live stream, and myself included, we've, we've all been brought up in a system that has basically programmed us to be good little authoritarian followers. Now, if you don't know what authoritarianism is, just look it up. There's a great book out there called The Authoritarians. The name of the author escapes me, but if you look up The Authoritarians, it'll come up on Google. Google, very useful tool. Authoritarianism is a system, it's a chain of command. Right. And authoritarian followers are people that believe in the government and the legal system. They trust in authorities outside of themselves. And we've all been brought up to obey this system without question. Think of anyone who's been to a public school or a private school. I've been to both. They're very similar to prisons. You have to sit down. You have to raise your hand and ask to go to the bathroom. You can only eat when they tell you you can eat. You can only get up and leave your seat when they tell you you can leave your seat. It's compulsory. You have to go to school from this time to that time. And if you're not in school, then you and your parents are gonna get in trouble from the legal system. That's authoritarianism, very similar to prison. So the whole thing with this compulsory school system is that it, over generation and generation, it instilled in the students and the people the mentality that you have to do this certain thing from this time to that time. Let's just say nine to five. I know that's not the case anymore, but let's just say for argument's sake, nine to five. They train you to be a good little worker bee. And so when you graduate, if you, go to, if you don't go to college, then you go right into the workforce and you're taught that you have to work a job Monday through Friday, Friday, nine to five, with overtime or whatever, for the rest of your life until such time as they tell you you can retire, right? That's an authoritarian system and it's based on religion in a roundabout way because all monotheistic religions are also authoritarian. Now the monotheistic uh, Abrahamic religions, they come from Judaism. You got Judaism, you got the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and then you have branches of that, subsets of that. You have Islam and Christianity, which are both authoritarian systems. In Islam, you submit to a law, right? You have to submit. You have to prostrate yourself in front of this entity. And it's the same thing with Christianity. You worship and submit to and prostrate yourself to 
the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, however you want to say it. Christianity, it would be Jesus. You know, in Judah, it would be Jehovah. Whatever, same idea. I'm not getting into religious beliefs. I'm talking about the way it's structured. It's structure, structured in a militaristic, authoritarian manner. Just think of the saying, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto the Lord what, the, what is the Lord's. Whoever said that is basically telling their followers, pay your taxes and pay the church, no matter what. And then, if someone slaps you, don't defend yourself. Turn the other cheek and let them slap the other cheek. Don't offer any resistance at all. Do what you're freaking told. Because when you die, you're going to get a reward in some imaginary heaven. That's authoritarianism. It's all a bunch of bullshit. So with correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, if you choose to learn that, then you have the tools to be your own authority. You can extricate yourself from that authoritarian system and be your own authority and be autonomous. You make the rules. And to put it in a negative condition of state, there is only one rule, friends and neighbors, and that's do no harm. Do no harm, public safety. It's very simple. Do not harm other people. Maliciously. I mean, you know, sometimes things happen where you're not aware that you're harming someone. But in that scenario, if it's brought to your attention that you're harming someone, you have to stop and correct. You have to make it, you have to make it right. You have to level the field. Like I get people that email me and they'll say, how do I get out of this speeding ticket? You know, I was going 60 miles an hour through a school zone where it's 15 miles an hour. How do I get out of that? Well, first of all, that's the wrong type of thinking. That's the wrong mentality. If you're already thinking about you want to get out of something, you're basically admitting that you did something wrong and you're trying to escape accountability. You don't want to be held responsible for what you've done. That's incorrect volition. There is no getting out of anything. If you were going 60 miles an hour in a 15 mile an hour school zone, then you need to be punished. You need to make it right. Because what if you would kill a child going through there, going that, that, that speed? It's public safety, do no harm. It's common sense, folks. So that's one thing I wanted to say. And then the other thing is, one may only make a claim for oneself, never make a claim for someone else. That's a trespass. That's what the fiction does. Correct sentence structure cannot force anyone to do anything. Correct sentence structure stops trespass. You know, I've been told by some of my students that there are certain mannerisms and sayings that I do that they know the hand gestures that I use, like stop the trespass, geometric level playing field, you know, these types of things. It's just funny. Maybe that would be a good drinking game. How many times Jason does this or does that or does that or whatever. Anyways, I got distracted there. Um, so you, you can't really use correct sentence structure to make someone pay you something or to send someone to prison. It doesn't work that way, folks. The fiction system does that. The fiction system wants to mandate... Um, the fiction system wants to use mandates on you. I'm not going to go too much into that. You know what I'm talking about. Correct sentence structure doesn't do that. Correct sentence structure can stop mandates, though, for sure. All right, let me, let me look over these comments real quick, and then I'm going to have to wrap this up. Any other people? Okay, I already said that. I'm going to email you. Okay, I look forward to that. I learned a new word 
right yesterday. Usfruct, the right to enjoy the use of another's property. Well, Usfruct is no contract because it's a vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word. And also, that's another authoritarian construct. The, the, the concept of rights. Rights are given to you by an authority outside of yourself. See, me, I don't participate with the concept of rights. That's a fiction uh, concept to me. Rights are given. Why do I say that? Because rights can be taken away. People protest for rights. You see that I, I, you have to see the dichotomy there. There's no need to use the word rights. You either have authority or you don't. You either know what you're doing or you don't. God given. What is God though? This is a shaker of salt. I can certify this. I can hand it to you. Can you certify what a God is? Probably not. So how are you going to get rights from an imaginary thing that has no power over you or anything else other than what you give it? It's the same thing with the fiction system. It wants you to believe that it has power over you. So that's the whole thing about correct sentence structure. You have to be able to certify your, um, your facts. I mean, you can claim that, that you are a god. I mean, it just depends upon what you mean by God. I don't participate with that concept of God. I feel that, and this is my own personal perception, I feel that religion and that whole concept was created to play upon mankind's fear of death. Because why else would a human being need, feel the need to participate with the concept of God? Some imaginary all-powerful being that has the power of life and death over us, but really doesn't because, I mean, there's no way to certify that. I feel that religion and people that say, oh, it's God's plan or the devil made me do it. They just don't want to take accountability for themselves. That's all. Closer to the truth is what I said at the beginning. You wouldn't exist if I wasn't thinking of you right now. If I wasn't sensing you right now, if I wasn't reading your comment, you wouldn't exist. And vice versa. I wouldn't exist to you if you weren't listening to me right now. That's a little bit closer to the truth. But I just don't like that word God. I like the word authority. It's much better and less dramatic. <laughs> Religion is for those who have a flair for the dramatic. And lots of people make money off of that shit, bro. Play it on people's fears. Religion is the, and especially the Bible and the Quran and things like that. It's the single most successful control me mechanism in PSYOP that was ever perpetrated upon mankind. Get people to believe in something they can't prove. Like, get people to believe in concepts of God and a, and a soul and demons and the devil, you can get them to believe in anything. I only participate with facts that I can certify and prove like a salt shaker or a tomato. So thanks everybody. Appreciate it. If you want to see this, uh, if you want to rewatch it, go over to my YouTube channel. I'll be uploading it in the next 24 to 48 hours. Thank you very much. Much gratitude to everybody out there who participated and watched. If you'd like to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, contact me at the email address listed at the bottom of your screen. I will set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation between you and me. You can ask me whatever you like. And I'll do the same, and we'll see if this is something that you're prepared to commit to. If you'd like to support the channel, click on the Join button underneath this video. There are two tiers of membership. Uh, the second tier has access to exclusive content not available to the public. Uh, hit the Subscribe button. Hit the Like button. Turn the notification bell to all so that you don't miss any of my premieres because I do post on a very consistent basis. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next one.